Hello, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, of course. The Lord has given us, uh, during this Memorial Day holiday where we have been studying his word, some interesting concepts that might, you might find challenging, but you will find very helpful. And uh, I want you to have the same peace that we have because we're all waiting with bated breath for the Lord's return. And in waiting for his return, we tend to get frustrated. And so when we get frustrated, we, we look to um, his word to understand, is there something we don't know yet? Is there something we haven't thought of? And in our studies today, it led us to some interesting conclusions. And what we are going to do is take you step by step to see if you come up with the same things that we do. Because if it's from the Lord, and if you pray, and we pray, we should all come to the same conclusions. So let me read some interesting history first, because in order to understand the Bible, you have to understand the history of man. And of course, the easiest place to start is the history of the Bible. So I'm going to read just some history. I'm going to put the links down below. You can check those links. You can look on Wikipedia. You can look at naysayers who say there is no truth to the Bible, but then you wouldn't be here because the Lord brought you. Therefore, you have to believe in the authenticity of the Bible, and therefore the best history we, history we have on how it came to be. So I'm going to read some things to you. The first one is on the um, Torah. Now the Torah is not the complete Old Testament. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible given us by Moses. So I'm going to give you a little history of the writing, uh, the copying of the Torah. We know that Moses wrote it. When the entire Pentateuch is present on a scroll, it is called the Torah. An entire Torah scroll, if completely unraveled, is over 150 feet long. As most sheep are only two to three feet long, it took an entire flock of sheep to make just one Torah scroll. The Jewish scribes who painstakingly produced each scroll were perfectionists. If they even made the slightest mistake in copying, such as allowing two letters of a word to touch, they destroyed the entire panel, the last three or four columns of the text, and the panel before it, because it had, it had touched the panel with a mistake. While most Christians today would consider this behavior fanatical and even idolatrous, worshiping the scripture rather than the one who gave it to us, it nevertheless demonstrates the level of faithfulness to accuracy applied to the preservation of God's word through the first couple of thousand years of biblical transmission. So that's a, if you think about that, 150 feet equal five books of the Old Testament an entire flock of sheep. I hope you will consider in your mind how rare and valuable that was and how if you wanted to read it, you had to be able to access it, which if you weren't a priest or a scribe or a Pharisee, you have to question would they even allow you, which brings us to some of the things in the New Testament when the literacy and the education of Yeshua and his disciples were in question. Now, in 380 AD, after the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord, 
The early church father, Jerome, translated the New Testament from its original Greek into Latin. This translation began, became known as the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate meaning vulgar or common. He put a note next to the Apocrypha books stating that he did not know whether or not they were inspired scripture or just Jewish historical writings which accompanied the Old Testament. By 500 AD, the Bible had been translated into over 50 languages, but now remember, no printing press, so it was handwritten. So you can still imagine it wasn't uh, something you went to the store and bought. It was rare. Um, just one century later, though, by 600 AD, it had been restricted to only one language, the Latin Vulgate, the only organized and recognized church at that time in history was the Catholic Church of Rome. They refused to allow the scripture to be available in any language other than Latin. Those in possession of non-Latin scriptures would be executed. This was because only the priests were educated to understand Latin, and this gave the church ultimate power, the power to rule without question, to deceive, a power to extort money from the masses. Nobody could question their biblical teachings because few people other than priests could read Latin. The church capitalized on this forced ignorance through the 1,000 year period from 400 A.D. to 1,400 A.D., uh, known as the Dark and the Middle Ages. Now, this is where we have to start thinking. The world is almost 6,000 years old, as we know it. That means that this is uh, up until, um, what did it say, 1400, which was only 600 years ago. It was very hard to read the Bible. It had to be the Lord who kept you, and it had to be uh, a real blessing for you. You were either given it handed down by tradition, etc., but to read it and to study it in its original languages was not available, but to a very, very, very few. Now, uh, uh, the next thing I want to read to you, and again, these sites will be uh, put down below, is the printing press. The printing press in, was invented by Johann Gutenberg in the 1450s. The first book to ever be printed was a Latin language Bible. Yay! But nobody read Latin. Um, it was printed in Mainz, Germany, um, and it was beautiful, hand illuminated, not many made. In the 1490s, another Oxford professor, uh, now I lost my pace, hold on a minute, <laughs> it went too far too fast. Uh, and f personal physician to King Henry the Seventh and Eighth, Thomas Lineker, decided to learn Greek. After reading the Gospels in Greek and comparing it to the Latin Vulgate, he wrote in his diary, either this, the original Greek language, is not the Gospel, or we are not Christians. The Latin had become so corrupt that it no longer even preserved the message of the gospel. Yet the church still threatened to kill anyone who read the scripture in any language other than Latin. And though Latin was not an original language of the scriptures. Now, in 1516... The great scholar Erasmus was so moved to correct 
the corrupt Latin Vulgate, that in 1516, with the help of printer John Froben, he published a Greek-Latin parallel New Testament. The Latin part was not the corrupt Vulgate, but his own fresh rendering of the text from the more accurate, reliable Greek which he had managed to collate from half a dozen partial Old Greek Testament manuscripts he had acquired. This milestone was the first non-Latin Vulgate text of the scripture to be produced in the millennium and was the first ever to come off a printing press. The 1516 Greek-Latin New Testament of Erasmus further focused attention on just how corrupt and inaccurate the Latin Vulgate had become, and how important it was to go back and use the original Greek and the original Hebrew, Old Testament and New Testament, languages to maintain accuracy and to translate them faithfully into the languages of the common people, whether that be English, German, or any other tongue. No sympathy for this illegal activity was to be found from Rome. Even the words of Pope Leo X's declaration that the fable of Christ was quite profitable to him continued to be the case. Now, if the Bible was not available, even in the 1500s because they were still fighting the Pope, it really did not become available till after the Reformation. And then... There was a lot of persecution in Europe, which is why people came to America, because they were so persecuted. It was only in America and after it had been established that the Bible became a household item. And then only if you had the money until probably sometime in the 1800s or in the last 150 years. So I ask you, to whom was the Bible written? Good question. Now let me read you a couple of quotes from the Bible. First one I'm going to give you is Daniel 12, verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. And then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. Psalm 102, 16, verse 16. For Yahweh has built up Zion. He's appeared in his glory. He has responded to the prayer of the destitute and has not despised their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come. A people which will be created will praise Yah. And 1 Corinthians ten eleven. Now all these things happened to them by way of example, that they were written for our admonition on whom the end of the ages have come. So think about it. Was it written for us? And if it was, if you're reading Isaiah, Jeremiah, the prophets, the New Testament, is it meant for the generations who had the availability ready for them, computers to look up the original languages and help us translate? And if so, what does that mean? Pray about it. Think about it. Ask the Lord. Read your scriptures with that in mind, and we'll continue on the next video. God bless.